I think we're going to get started at like uh, 205. Works for me. Um, one thing I'm going to add, we're going to run live captions. Um, and I just dropped a link to live captions in the chat. If you click on it, it's going to open up in a new window. Um, yeah, it's usually OK. It messes up sometimes. But yeah, I hope it's helpful. Thanks, Yulia. That's going to be fun with the Hawaiian words. <laughs> That was just a test. Okay, if you joined late, I'm just gonna drop the link for live captions once again. If you click on this link, live captions are gonna open up in a new window and hopefully it's helpful.
Well, should we get rolling? Sweet. Um, cool. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, Mariah, are you? You're, I can start now. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for virtually joining us <laughs> for this teaching on Settler Colonial University. Um, thanks, Carly and Will, for asking me to help out with this. So usually we begin a discussion or teaching like this with a land acknowledgement of the original caretakers of the land or the place in which we're gathered. So in Santa Cruz, we would acknowledge the Amamutsun tribal band, who are the descendants of the Awaswas and Mutsun tribal nations. Um, but this is a bit more complicated since we are um, gathered virtually, so we're all likely in very different places that hold different indigenous histories so therefore one single land acknowledgement may not really suffice for this situation um, so we consider this as something that each of us can individually discuss in our introductions and i can try to share this um or will do you have the the introduction thing that i sent it won't let me share my screen All right, I can make you a co-host and maybe it will let you. Give me a second. Okay. Oh, no, I can't because I'm not host anymore. <laughs> Sorry. <It's fine. laughs> um, um, so basically we just thought a good way would be to like start off with brief introductions. Um, maybe say your, your name and your gender pronouns what school or organizations you may be affiliated with, what made you want to attend this teaching or what you hope to learn. And then if you know, what is the name of the indigenous people whose land you're currently located? Um, and if you don't know, it's okay, but we wanna encourage you to look into that, especially or any place that you go. Oh, perfect, cool. Um, so I can go first. My name is Mariah. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm an enrolled tribal member of the Comanche Nation. And I'm also Chicana and Irish. Um, I'm a first year PhD student in the history department at UC Santa Cruz, studying indigenous history and the impact of environmental catastrophe on the Great Plains in the 19th century, um, brought on by Anglo-American settler colonialism, particularly through the unprecedented slaughter of the North American bison. Um, so I'm here because I want to learn. I always learn something new every time I hear Will or Carly speak. Um, so I'm grateful to be a part of this conversation. Uh, during this year, or this year during the COLA strike, I've been organizing with COLA for All, um, UCSC Mauna Kea Protectors, and the People's Coalition. Um, I'm currently quarantined in my parents' house in the South Sacramento area. And the original caretakers of this land are the Miwok people who have lived in this area for at least 4,000 years. And to this day, the Miwok people still carry on their tribal customs through cultural heritage education, whether that's through um, ceremonial dances or educational talks. I can go next. Uh, thanks, Mariah. Um, so I'm Carly Dorego. I'm one of the people leading this workshop with Mariah and Will. Um, I originally came to UCSC to pursue my, pursue my uh, PhD in anthropological archaeology um, and native Hawaiian diaspora on the west coast of the U.S. mainland. Um, but after the Mauna Kea incident in July of 2019 that I'll talk about more, um, I decided to change my dissertation topic to Mauna Kea. Um, I was one of the 82 graduate students who was fired. Um, so I've decided to leave the program. I have a master's though, so it's all good. And I was just hired for a job, so that's all good too. Um, <laughs> yeah, all great things. Um, so right now I'm kind of just quarantined in Idaho um, where my boyfriend is a master's student here. Um, I'm specifically in Moscow, Idaho, which is on the border of Lake Washington and Idaho. Um, and the people who um, kind of call this place their ancestral home 
um, are the Blackfoot, the Nez Perce, and Spokane, although it's a little bit farther, but you know, Native peoples don't tend to think about boundaries um, in the Western US like we do. So um, I'm here occupying this land right now, and I know that they are continuously celebrating it through like yearly traditions and celebrations together, which is awesome. And yeah, I'm going to be talking about the Mauna Kea stuff primarily um, in this workshop. I should also say that I'm Native Hawaiian, totally forgot to mention that. Um, and I was born and raised in Hawaii, so yeah. Hi folks, I'm Anuj. I'm a student from UC Davis. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I've been uh, working with folks here at Davis um, as part of the Strike University team. And so it's been really amazing to see uh, the offerings from all the other campuses. And it's been really incredible to, to learn from everyone else. Um, I, my own work is I'm in the performance studies program and my work is looking at this uh, tradition from South Asia, the Ramayana tradition, and looking at how it actually shapes our relationship to forests in South Asia and to forest peoples and to native peoples who live in the forest, forest dwellers. And so I'm very interested also in the conversation that bridges these different uh, places that I move between India and the US. Um, here in Davis, um, this is traditionally the land of Patwin peoples. Um, and, um, and I'm really, I mean, what drew me to this uh, workshop was really um, wanting to know more and learning more about how the UC system is really implicated in, in settler colonialism seemed like a good place to start. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Will Parrish. I am a PhD student in history of consciousness. At UC Santa Cruz, I'm co-leading this uh, workshop with Mariah and Carly. Um, I live on Owaswas Baloney speaking land in Santa Cruz. Um, and that's all I'm going to say for now. Um, actually, and I want to just encourage people actually, um, since there's a lot of us and it's been taking about a minute per person to go through all this, that would mean like, um, like a third of the workshop would be taken with introductions if we all took a minute. So maybe if people could just say their name, campus, and then like a sentence sort of drawing from the three questions. I can quickly go. Hi, my name is Yulia. I use the and she pronouns. I live on uh, Awas West Territory um, in Santa Cruz. Um, yeah, and my research has to do with geographies of settler innocence, and I look specifically at Israel and Palestine. Uh, and yeah, very excited to learn from all of you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Madeline. Um, she, her pronouns. I'm in Santa Cruz, so on Oaswas land, and I'm involved with the DSA chapter in Santa Cruz and just interested in learning more about what's going on in Hawaii. With me. Hi, I'm Martibel. I'm a first year PhD student at Stanford, uh, she, her pronouns, and I'm also in Santa Cruz on a Was Was territory, and I'm just here to learn. Um, I'm Eleanor. I'm a second year undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I use they and them pronouns and I am uh, currently on, uh, I know Ohlone speaking land in Oakland, um, but not sure exactly um, the people I'm looking at though. <laughs> I'm Katie, she, hers. I'm a physics student at UC Berkeley, which campus is situated on Chochechnya Ohlone land. And I am trying to um, further educate myself about the situation at Mauna Kea, which is um, overdue for me, but here I am. Hey, 
Hey, uh, my name's Sabrina. I'm in Santa Cruz, so I think I'm on a was was territory. That's what other people are saying. I'm not super sure if everyone in Santa Cruz is on that territory, but I'm going to look into it. And um, I graduated from UCSC a year ago. I studied molecular biology. Um, I'm a part of the SA, and I'm just here to learn more. So, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Annie. Um, I go by she, her pronouns. I actually studied um, at University of Hawaii at Manoa, so I'm um, reconnecting to Hawaiian struggles. Um, and I actually teach urban planning at Cal Poly Pomona. Nice to meet folks. Hi, I'm Sylvia. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm actually on Omaha land in Nebraska, and I'm here because of my background in higher education and uh, general interest in the UC system, it's happening. Hi everyone, um, I am Bristol, I use she, her pronouns, um, and I live on Amamutsan territory, but um, near Mount Amunham, um, off summit, and uh, I just want to plug, if no one has been to the Sierra Azul Nature Preserve up there, um, Mamunhum is sacred space for Amamutsan, and they were really um, fundamental in like shaping a nature preserve up there. That's really great if you haven't been. You can see three of the four highest points in the bay. Those who joined late, we're just doing a quick intro uh, with your name. Um, if you know the indigenous land you're on, or if you just want to say um, what brought you to the workshop or something you hope to learn. Um, It'd be good to set a goal maybe of wrapping this up in about five minutes. So yeah, if we could go through with that in mind. Thanks. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Greg Johnson and I'm a professor at UC Santa Barbara, but I'm currently on Cheyenne Arapaho lands in Colorado. And I'm keenly interested to learn more how you're all thinking about these issues. I was involved as this in the contested case hearing for Mauna Kea, and I've been involved in both the major stands up there. So I'm eager to hear your perspectives. Uh, I can go. Hi, uh, Quentin, he, him. Uh, also in the Santa Cruz area. Um, so Was Was land, uh, also Amma Mudson. Um, and yeah, I uh, just graduated from a master's program and hired as a part-time lecturer in the film and digital media department. So excited about my case specifically, but also, you know, the uh, challenge in decolonizing inherently colonial institutions. Um, hi, my name is Luna. I'm an undergraduate senior at UCI. Um, I'm involved with the YDSA chapter at UC Irvine, as well as the UAW 2865 Student Union um, at my campus. Also, I acknowledge that the University of um, California Irvine is located on the stolen homelands of the um, Akjak Chemin and Tongava um, nations, which I'm pretty sure I mispronounced those, so I apologize for that. And I just wanted to join this meeting to learn more about the ties of um, settler, settler colonialism and the UC system. Uh, I can go. Uh, I'm Lachlan, I'm at UCSC, um, but because I got fired, uh, I'm now living in Mexico City, um, like the old city state of Tenochtitlan, uh, of the Mexico people. Um, I've caught Carly and Will uh, give these teachings a couple of times before, and they're always great, so I thought I'd come here. Hi, all. My name is Sophia. I use she, her pronouns. Right now, I'm living in San Diego, which is Cormier land, um, and I'm an undergraduate student at UC Santa Cruz, and I'm here because I want to learn more about what, <laughs> how I, as a student, am engaging with um, settler, settler colonial violence just by being a student. Um, and I want to be more aware.
anyone else like to go? You don't have to go. I can go. Hi, everybody. My name is Cynthia. I'm currently a guest on Ho Chin, that is the unceded territories of the Chichenyo Lonely in the Bay Area. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Ethnic Studies, and I'm here because I'm excited to build with folks who are interested in reimagining what um, the UC could look like, uh, decolonizing land, land back, etc. Thanks. I say it's kind of hard. I don't know if it's true for everyone else. It's hard to hear you. How about now? That's better. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, my pronouns are they, them. I'm on Owaswas territory and I'm an undergrad art student at UCSC. And yeah, I'm here just to learn more about the process of decolonization and hopefully figure out ways to get more involved. Thank you. So um, yeah, it is getting um, pretty late into our a lot of time here. So if there's uh, maybe just one or two people who have um, things they really want to share with the group about themselves, um, maybe bringing in something that hasn't been represented so far, um, like an area or an affiliation um, that you want to bring into this space. One of those Zoom moments where you can't tell if people are thinking about it or or not. So um, let's hold a few more seconds of space here. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks. Yeah, thanks so much to everybody. Um, Mariah, are you? Um, Carly, did you want to um, give your definition of settler colonialism and I can kind of maybe add to it? Yeah, sure. So um, since introductions took a little bit longer, I think, than we possibly could have anticipated, um, let's just jump right in and talk about um, how at least I define settler colonialism, and Mariah's gonna add to that and how it's connected to the UC. Um, but since this whole workshop is about settler colonialism, let's just give a straightforward definition um, about how we can think of and imagine settler colonialism. So identifying um, the violent and pervasive uh, nuanced ways in which colonialism has occurred um, is necessary in, in understanding any kind of Native protection movements, uh, like when Native peoples are, ch are challenging these settler structures. Um, while we could spend a whole many hours on Zoom um, defining colonialism and the history of it, settler colonialism is completed with the intention of displacing indigenous people of that land, um, those people who have considered um, their land or the, the land that they occupy as their land since time and memoriam. Uh, so settler colonialism begins with the transplant of settlers to a new space uh, to create a new society that promotes the erasure of native peoples. And the hope is that these settlers will stay and shift all aspects of societal structures and cultures of the, over time. Um, and these new societies will then have a sense of, a new sense of ownership over the space, uh, land and resources that were taken from native peoples. Additionally, settler colonialism is embedded within all kinds of nationalist attitudes, uh, federal and state institutions, the way that we structure laws, um, the court systems, the documents, uh, that we have founded this country on, we, not myself. Um, and um, it can also be seen in um, academia, which is kind of where this workshop is headed. 
um, the way that we as academics or those of us who are academics um, in this workshop consult the land that we study, uh, the people that we interview specifically, like I'm an anthropologist, as I said, or an archeologist. So interviewing people is kind of fundamental to that. And the methodologies that we do in the name of um, this kind of idea of academic exploration. So Mariah. Can you hear me? Wait, Will, did you want to say the thing about Berkeley? Right now? Are, you talking, are you talking about your definition of settler colonialism? Oh, okay. well, I mean, Carly did a great job. <laughs> okay, sweet. Um, in that case, yes, I would like to do that. Um, so yeah, building off what Carly was saying, um, this, this workshop is focused on settler colonialism in relationship to the University of California. Uh, and uh, that is a very sort of under-researched, under-explored topic. Um, and it's interesting to think about you know, why that is. And I think in order to sort of get into this, um, we're just gonna start with a quick story um, that I'm going to split screen an image to serve as a background for. So, um, sorry, hold on one second. Okay, can people see that? Okay, so um, I'm starting, this is uh, an image that is on a, a website of UC Berkeley. Um, celebrating the 150 year anniversary of, of Berkeley's founding and depicts um, the trustees of the University of California, basically the people who started the university, standing in the hills of the East Bay in 1860. They're looking out across the bay, across the gate of the bay that's now spanned by the Golden Gate Bridge and um, as the story goes, they, this is where, where they decided to name the first UC campus Berkeley. Um, and the reason that they decided to do that was that in a, in a poem written by the, the British philosopher George Berkeley, um, he had this line uh, that said westward the course of empire takes its way like the full stanza is something like westward the course of empire takes its way the first four acts already passed blah 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 it's not it's not actually that important it's just the line westward the course of empire takes its way and at the time um it was fairly well known in popular culture that westward the course of empire takes its way um was synonymous with the idea of manifest destiny. Uh, and in fact, um, the journalist who coined the term manifest destiny um, specifically cited George Berkeley's poem about Westward the Courts of Empire Takes Its Way in, in the newspaper column that he wrote, coining that term. Manifest destiny is the idea that um, Christian, Western, white supremacist civilization is divinely ordained to spread um, across the entirety of the continent of the United States and, and, and beyond out to the West, uh, spreading Christian civilization uh, and displacing, or you know, it's basically implied killing, um, dispossessing indigenous people. So, uh, the founders of the university had that in mind when they decided to name the first UC campus in 1860. Uh, and as we go through this workshop, we'll talk about different ways that the university has actually actively lived up to the vision that its founders um, established in that moment. Um, so yeah, so now we can talk a bit more about, or talk a bit about the Morrill Act and land grab universities. 
um, and the historical connections between indigenous land dispossession and the foundation of land grant universities in the United States. And I mean, I'm still in the process of learning a lot of this myself, so, but I'm happy to share what I've learned so far. And Carly, will anyone feel free to jump in if I leave anything out? Um, so in the early 19th century, advocates of agricultural education were lobbying the government to create colleges and universities specifically for agricultural and mechanical learning. And this came to fruition in 1862 when the Morrill Act granted eligible states thousands of acres of land to establish institutes of learning that would focus on agriculture, science, military science, and engineering. And ultimately, the act redistributed nearly 11 million acres of indigenous land scattered mostly across 24 western states. And this land was violently and coercively stolen from nearly 250 indigenous tribes, bands, and communities to help fund the new colleges. And what came of this was um, 52 different universities. And so the University of California institutions, along with dozens of other public college campuses throughout the United States, are a direct product of the Morrill Act, um, which Abraham Lincoln signed into effect under his creed, the right to rise. Um, so the Morrill Act set Mariah's frozen for everyone else. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yay, Zoom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Mariah, are you there now? No? Okay. Um, all right. Well, um, Mariah was right in the middle of talking about the Morrill Act and um, it would probably be best if we reserved like the rest of the content for Mariah when she comes back. But uh, you know, basically, um, Mariah is talking about how uh, this act of Congress was passed in the 1860s. Um, it um, basically expropriated indigenous land without compensating indigenous people for that land, uh, and uh, universities were established on that land, and also universities were able to sell that land to raise capital uh, for their endowments or to fund the establishment of the universities. So um, at the time that the UC founders were looking out and dreaming of their like empire university in 1860, um, they didn't have any money and um, the Murillo Act allowed them to to establish the university with money from expropriated indigenous territory. Um, so, um, I think I'm, I was gonna be next, is that right? Um, so, yeah, we, um, we we're gonna sort of go through uh, kind of episodically uh, and talk about some episodes in the history of the university that we think really underscore how the UC has um, played a unique role in enacting settler colonial. So I think one, one thing that's important to think about as we go through this is that um, the unit um, has its own history and you know the outlines of that history are basically that uh, UC Berkeley was the first UC campus um, that was the case for a long time um, gradually you got some other campuses coming in in the late 1800s early 1900s UCLA uh, UC Davis was founded as a branch of UC Berkeley initially um, and then you know there's sort of a explosion in the post-war period of university development and construction um, 
in the mid 20th century. So um, to talk about the history of the university for the first, you know, 100 years or so, or, you know, especially the first 50 years, you're really talking about UC Berkeley and then somewhat some other campuses. Um, and it's surprising to, to sort of realize like the degree to which the university is, is tied to some major events um, in, you know, basically the imperial expansion of the United States. Uh, and then alongside that, the way that um, the system of settler colonialism is taking shape in the, in the United States and that the UC is a part of it. So um, like the, the framing that we're using to understand settler colonialism is that uh, it's not an event, uh, it's a structure. Um, and like common, common construction of settler colonialism is that like, okay, so there was this invasion that happened at some point. Um, indigenous people were removed from the land or they were, you know, there was a genocide and then, um, you know, that event is what defines settler colonialism. But um, actually there's a structure that's created that is always contested. You know, indigenous people or the people who are subject to settler colonialism are basically always fighting back. They're always trying to um, develop space to, to contest the structure. And so that's sort of like an overall lens that we're thinking about uh, as, we, as we talk about the things that we're talking about in the workshop. Um, and I think, Mariah, are you back, Mariah? Like, uh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, okay. Head so yeah, here. now that I've said that, maybe <laughs> Mariah, and then when Mariah's done, we'll jump ahead. Okay. To I'm not too sure what things. I last heard. Um, but yeah, I was basically talking about how Congress essentially offered thousands of acres of indigenous lands to each state for free as capital um, for colleges, which are now known as land grant universities. And the Morrill Act, worked by creating profit off of the stolen land from tribal nations in order to fund higher education, which they, attend, which they attained through over 160 land seizures and violence-backed treaties. So the idea was to aid economic development by broadening access to higher education for the nation's um, farm hands and the industrial class in order to um, modernize the economy. And so historically, Land grant universities were a way of supporting the country through economic growth in fields like agriculture, science, and engineering. Um, so therefore, the, univer the University of California campuses are not just physically located on unceded ancestral territories of indigenous people, but millions of acres of indigenous land was sold to fund the land grant universities in the United States and the violent history of higher education's connection to the displacement of Native people has purposely remained inaccessible to the public at large, as many settler colonial histories are. Um, and I got a lot of this information and data from an incredible investigative research article that was just released about two weeks ago by High County, High Country News on Land Grab University. Um, but these researchers created an extensive da database on, based on reporting and primary resource materials, including land patent records, congressional documents, historical maps, um, archival and print resources, state repositories, special collections at universities, etc. Um, and it shows how the Murrell Act turned indigenous land into college endowments and reveals two things that are hardly discussed today, including how, according to the Murrell Act, all money made from the land sales must be used in perpetuity. So these funds still remain on the university ledgers to this day. And also that at least 12 states are still in possession of unsold Murrell acres, as well as associated mineral rights, um, which continue to produce funding for their designated institutions. 
And to, so to terminate indigenous rights to millions of acres of land by the Merrill Act, the U.S. technically paid less than $400,000. However, more than a quarter of the land was outright confiscated through violent force and or through treaties that were never ratified by the federal government. Um, so by the early 20th century, the grants raised more than 17 million for university endowments with unsold land valuing at an additional 5 million. And when adjusted for inflation, these grants were worth about half a billion dollars. And so earlier we talked a little bit about land acknowledgements. And so if land acknowledgements are used in a university setting at all, these land acknowledgements usually only acknowledge that the campus itself is built directly on indigenous land. However, these grants were huge, some of them as big as huge cities like Los Angeles, um, and often located thousands of miles away from the university that benefits from them. So in addition to schools being built on these lands, today there's airports, gas stations, neighborhoods, um, restaurants, churches, cemeteries, chain stores like Walmart, stuff like that. Um, that's all located on lands that were accumulated and sold through the Merrill Act to fund universities. So it's unquestionable that the history of land grant universities directly intersects with the dispossession of indigenous people. And as many of us are aware, coercion and fraud was present in every treaty. And as of this day, not a single treaty between the US and indigenous communities has been honored by the federal government. Um, and these treaties were often only offered as an alternative to their extinction or extermination. Um, and even if a treaty was signed, the attempt of extermination, the attempt of extermination and the seizure of unceded land was still likely to occur. Um, and so, yeah, settler colonial colonialist ideals view the land as something to be sold and exploited for profit which is what we see with the land grant universities. And in California, many indigenous communities were hunted to near extinction as bounties were placed on, on indigenous people by the state and reimbursed by the federal government. And in, this encouraged the carving up of traditional territories without any compensation. So 32 land grant universities got a share of California native land, raising approximately 3.6 million dollars from over 1.7 million acres. And so the University of California system capitalized on 150,000 acres and the university ran a real estate operation that sold plots of installment plans, um, generating a lot of income for the UC system. And so in the late 19th century, income from the fund covered as much as a third of the UC's annual operating expenses. And today, more than 500,000 acres that were unwillingly taken from tribal nations to um, remain held in trust for at least 12 universities. And in 2019 alone, these lands produced more than five and a half million dollars in revenue for colleges. So they're still using this money along with charging crazy amounts of tuition. Um, and it's just... <laughs> Um, but yeah, one quote that I found that I wanted to share to kind of wrap this part up was a quote from Dr. Sharon Stein, who said, there, will be no higher, there would be no higher education as we know it in the United States without the original and ongoing colonization of indigenous peoples and lands, just like there would be no United States. There is no moment or time or place or institution that is not deeply entangled with the violence of colonialism. And having these conversations about the colonial foundations of these institutions can complicate the narratives that we are told of how higher education um, improves the quality of life, essentially. And so violent seizures of land were used to launch 52 land grant, you know, land grant institutions, while indigenous people remain largely absent from student populations, staff, faculty, and curriculum. Please. I'm just going to talk about next. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm going to briefly go back to what I was starting to say. 
I was, I was talking about we're gonna we're gonna go through a few episodes of of that relate to how the UC has been not only an institution that's reinforced but has act, actively promoted settler colonialism in its history. Um, Mariah just you know basically uh, showed us how um, the original dispossession of indigenous people is continuing to accumulate capital for the university. So like, you know, clearly there's a direct connection between the original you know, invasion of indigenous territory and you know, the way the university is right now there. Um, and what I, what I want to talk about a little bit is how the university's geographic reach uh, goes beyond just UC campuses in other ways uh, and actually um, has, you know, the university has participated in the process of settler colonization of, of territories, you know, well beyond uh, California in really active, violent ways. Um, and I'm going to give two main, main examples of that. Um, and I'm, I'm just, you know, we're running a little bit late, so I'm just going to do this really briefly. But um, in the late 1800s, um, you know, in 1898, the, the Spanish-American War uh, took place. You know, one, one aspect of that was the U.S. invasion of, of the Philippine Islands. And uh, in the popular press at the time, uh, this, you know, the, the invasion of the Philippines was openly talked about as sort of a second act or a new act in, in the U.S.'s historical wars against uh, indigenous people that had happened on the continent of the, the United States and led to, like, the consolidation of the United States across the entire continent. But now, like, they're enacting the same kind of historical process in the invasion of the Philippines where a lot of indigenous people lived and uh, the university had a surprising uh, relationship to to that, that process um, you know basically the policy of the Spanish and then the United States was uh, to take um, you know Christian settlers and uh, promote them expanding into native Moro and Lumad territory um, in in what is now considered you know the Philippines uh, and um, University of California president, uh, David Barrows, you know, the guy who's the president of the university at the time was, um, uh, appointed to some major, a couple of different major official posts in the Philippines to assist with that process. Uh, he was the chief of the Bureau of Non-Christian Tribes of the Philippine Islands. That was his title. Um, and then later he was the superintendent of of education uh, for the occupation government in the Philippines. Um, and so he was, he was instrumental to, to developing and carrying out a program of basically re-education um, of indigenous people uh, in the Philippines as part of a process of settler colonization there. Um, so, you know, there's a lot more that could be said about like the UC's connection to the conquest of the Philippines in that period and the settler colonization of indigenous people there. Um, but, uh, you know, the gist is that like they were, the top UC people were involved in that process. Um, university programs were involved in that process. And the more you research this kind of stuff, the more you find that like, throughout history uh, in, in the university, whether it's like the mining programs, engineering programs, Various programs have had um, a direct connection to settler colonial processes. And I'm just, you know, with the interest of time, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I'm going to um, briefly talk about um, scientific institutions and settler colonialism and the relationship between that, just to set up some of these um, instances in which we can see settler colonialism in academia. So um, basically, like I said earlier, these like settler colonialism can be seen 
basically everywhere um, in most institutions that we know um, around the world. And specifically, you know, looking at America, um, our, rep our reputation as being settler colonial and an imperialist nation precedes it. But uh, in academia, we believe that uh, with intensive examination of literature um, and the opportunity to do our own research, we can find the answers um, to almost anything and everything in the world around us. Uh, and this is just something that's instilled into us in academia and the, theor the theories that we learn, the methodologies, methodologies and epistemologies. Um, and this comes from the time of the Enlightenment when we were told, well, those before us were told that we can come to know everything in the world with scientific and empirical methodologies. Um, and the concept of academic exploration and prioritizing your research above, uh, say, communities who may not be interested in being a part of your research um, is inherently colonial and privileged of us. Uh, first of all, we're incredibly privileged for those of us who are academics to be in higher institution pursuing this knowledge and pursuing these degrees, uh, but also just to say that our research is above all important um, from our informants is just incredibly privileged and settler colonial of us. Um, and as academics, we should be open to helping communities who are research directly and indirectly impacts, uh, including understanding uh, that their consent and consultation is needed before moving forward with your own research. That should be actually the first step before even pursuing your research is getting um, the necessary uh, consent from appropriate um, beings before even taking the step to go into these spaces where you might not be welcomed. Um, I understand this is really difficult to accept, especially since a lot of us come from academic uh, disciplines and families in which, you know, we may not have had to get the consent of these people beforehand, um, historically speaking. Uh, like I said, I'm an archaeologist, which is one of the most, if not the most, colonial uh, discipline in academia in that um, archaeology and anthropology was historically used probably even maybe 70 years ago to forward um, like a colonial agenda in that we can other people and we can try and study them as if they're animals which is totally wrong and incorrect um, so my discipline is built on this colonialism and imperialism so in archaeology, um, from stealing artifacts to creating research to further a colonial project, there's no denying that archaeology has a colonial past. And if I were to deny it, I'm complicit in furthering its colonial history. But I do not have to be what my discipline used to represent and become what I want to be. So being a Native Hawaiian um, archaeologist, I need to put the consent of my people first in my research, which isn't just me asking myself, is, am I okay with this? It's me making sure I go to the appropriate parties and beings first, which includes um, state organizations like the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, individuals, um, community members, uh, other leaders in the community that are cultural practitioners or activists, to try and get the approval at every stage of the project, not just at the beginning or at the end, but ensuring that every step that I take is approved and you know, excited by them. And while we can be disappointed in the past of our discipline or the past of whatever academia represents, if you're not an academic, it could be also you know, the people that have like previously lived on your land and treated um, those who call that land their native land we can be the change that we want to see by abandoning a lot of these settler colonial ideas um, and structures um, today. Good. Um, <clears throat> now that Carly's um, offered those um, really important words about how scientific disciplines within universities uh, can and do um, and these you know, settler colonial relations and patterns, um, but we don't have to continue uh, along that trajectory. Um, I'm going to talk about what I think is kind of the ultimate example of pretty much any university 
um, acting in the settler colonial fashion with scientific research, um, which is um, nuclear weapons. And um, I'm gonna queue up a slideshow here. Um, hopefully it works. Just give me a sec. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so what are we looking at? We're looking at um, the largest nuclear detonation ever carried out by the United States. This is the Cas Castle Bravo. Uh, thermonuclear uh, detonation in the South Pacific in 1954. Um, and <clears throat> when this detonation happened, um, University of California regents, um, scientists, members of Congress in California were actually invited to view the test uh, from an island uh, that's part of the Hawaiian island chain called Coconut Island um, that was owned at the time by a UC regent named Edwin Pauley. Uh, and they, they, sat, they set themselves up um, you know, in a similar fashion to what we see here. This is not them necessarily. I'm not sure who this is exactly other than like some military personnel. It's kind of like a stock photo, but you know, basically, um, you know, these regents, UC scientists, politicians, and, and other officials and dignitaries um, basically set themselves up in the Iron Dak chairs with special sunglasses, and they, they watched this, you know, thermonuclear fireball rose over the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles away. Um, and, you know, they treated it like a spectacle, they treated it like a celebration, uh, the regent who's seen this um, was you know, provided different forms of entertainment like Polynesian dancers after the explosion happened. Um, so you know, why, why was the University of California, why were these leaders of the university celebrating uh, this nuclear explosion? And why did they feel such a connection to it? Um, and I actually have the slides a little out of order with what I'm saying, but you know, so people lived uh, on the islands where these explosions happened. Uh, this is an image of some of the, the Marshall Islands inhabitants evacuating uh, in advance of the nuclear test because um, they were basically forced to evacuate by uh, the US military and to relocate for several years. Um, in order to make way for these nuclear explosions to happen. That said that, you know, not the uh, Marshall Islands is a string of like 24, I think, um, atolls um, in the South Pacific and not everyone in the Marshall Islands evacuated. Many of them in sort of more distant areas were subject to um, nuclear fallout from these explosions. And the connection the university has is very clear. The University of California uh, from the beginning of the nuclear age has managed the two main nuclear weapons research and design laboratories on behalf of the United States government that develop and carry out nuclear weapons tests um, for the US nuclear arsenal. So this is the Los Alamos National Laboratory entrance sign operated by the University of California. Um, the University of California has managed this laboratory uh, as well as the Lawrence Livermore uh, National Laboratory here in California since they were founded um, or been a co-manager of them. So for a while, like back when I was an undergrad at UCSC, we, we used to say that uh, every nuclear weapon in the U.S. arsenal was designed by an employee of the University of California uh, because of this connection 
uh, to the UC. Like that's no longer technically true, um, but it was at the time. And so UC scientists were, were basically the ones designing and orchestrating these nuclear weapons explosions that dispossessed indigenous people and irradiated their homelands uh, in the South Pacific. This is an image of um, Edward Teller, who was a UC scientist who was specifically recruited to the university uh, to work on thermonuclear bombs. Like he was the mastermind of the test that I showed the, the image of um, at the beginning of this slideshow. And uh, yeah, he is, for those who have seen the movie Dr. Strangelove, one of his nicknames is the real Dr. Strangelove. Um, like he was actually an inspiration for the maniacal um, nuclear weapons obsessed scientific character in that movie um, to some degree. Um, so he was a UC scientist. He was um, one of many um, UC scientists who were instrumental in setting up the entire US nuclear weapons research and design apparatus. And um, that entire apparatus for the first like 20 years of, the, of um, the existence of nuclear weapons revolved around above ground nuclear detonations, like in the Marshall Islands. There were 67 above ground uh, nuclear weapons detonations in the Marshall Islands. Um, the explosive power of those um, nuclear bombs was equivalent to if one and a half Hiroshima sized bombs went off every day for more than 12 years. So, um, these were like infinitely more destructive than the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, which um, the UC is also connected to. This image here is of the Nevada nuclear test site. So here is um, where the US moved most of its nuclear weapons testing after it stopped testing the Marshall Islands. Um, since 1963, they've done nuclear weapons tests below ground. Uh, and so this image is actually of sort of the pock marks that are created from underground nuclear weapons tests that UC scientists were also instrumental in carrying out. And um, the New Nevada nuclear weapons test site um, is located on land of the Nue Segobia, the Western Shoshone people who actively resisted um, nuclear weapons testing on their land for years um, and actually had massive gatherings of thousands of people to, to resist nuclear weapons testing. This is an image of um, a legendary indigenous leader named Corbin Harney from around 1990 at one of those gatherings. So, you know, the UC has played kind of just an unparalleled role, like no, one, no other university has been involved in anything quite like this, uh, probably anywhere in the world, certainly not in the United States. Um, that's how uh, instrumental the UC has been to the new program um, of the United States. And um, there's a concept that people develop to understand the effect of the nuclear weapons and nuclear power fuel cycle on indigenous people called radioactive colonization. It so happens that uh, indigenous people are extremely disproportionately exploited, their lands used, you know, uh, uranium developed on their lands, nuclear weapons testing developed on their lands or carried out on their lands, um, processing of other materials for nuclear production on their lands. So, so the UC was was and to an extent remains at the heart of that because the UC continues managing these labs uh, and they still operate the Nevada nuclear test site, although they aren't doing nuclear explosions right now that reach nuclear criticality. Um, they do other kinds of tests there. So I'm trying to figure out how to turn off the slideshow now. Oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, UC and nukes. It's pretty crazy. Um, what's what's our next 
thing? Are we going straight to Mauna Kea? Yeah, kind of looking at the time, I think maybe it's more appropriate to go to Mount Kea. Mariah? Sounds good. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, so, hi again. I'm Carly, everybody. Um, oh, there's a question in the chat or about to be a question. Actually, it was just based on the, the the presentation just now. You mentioned the UC professor on whom Dr. Strangelove was based. Could you tell us the name of the, the person again? I missed that, sorry. Uh, Edward Teller. Um, actually, you. you said you're at Davis, right? Uh, he actually helped found an institute okay. there that is still operating that I suggest you look into. Thank you. Edward sure. Teller. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So I guess I have um, the space now to talk about Mauna Kea. I do have a PowerPoint that I could show or I could talk, but I guess setting up screen sharing is a little bit harder than it would be normally. Is that correct? Right? You have to make me a host or something. Uh, anyone? Um, working on it. Oh, don't worry. Yeah, take your time. Um, but yeah, I can uh, just start or make me a co-host. Thank you, Kate Ross. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. This will be fun. I've never done this before. So um, sorry about that, folks. Can somebody walk me through how to screen share? <laughs> if you go to the bottom of your screen and click on the green mm -hmm. share, uh, mm -hmm. it should it should ask you what window you want to share and you can click on the window. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, great. Now we have to open um, system preferences. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Just give me a second to do this. Okay, that should hopefully work. If not, then we can just do it old school. Sorry, everyone, just bear with me for a few more <laughs> seconds. Here it is. All right, it's not working. So we'll just um, do it old school, like I said. Oh. Hey, we have rounds. We might. Okay. Lachlan, you're not muted. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Those who don't know. So we're gonna talk about wine history, wine cosmology. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about archeology span since that's what I study. Um, and then we're gonna go into Mauna Kea and more about the, um, like the telescopes and astronomical activity and why um, say the 30 meter telescope should be built on um, Mount Ikea instead of somewhere else. Um, so if you came into this workshop knowing nothing about Mount Ikea, you're going to know a lot about Mount Ikea. Um, but currently right now um, there's uh, imminent threat of construction 
of this thing called the 30 meter telescope on Mauna Kea, which is considered um, Native Hawaiian's um, most sacred um, mountain. It's the most sacred space, and I'll talk about why it is. Um, but with the imminent threat of the construction of this large entity for astronomical activity, Native Hawaiians have had to step up in which the government has not been able to protect them. So this is how we have Native Hawaiians protecting their space and occupying the access roads to Mauna Kea, which started in July, but I'll talk more about that. So just a little brief introduction. So um, Hawaii was first uh, occupied by voyagers in what we think to be the years 300 to 400 AD. They were Tahitians. Um, so for those of us who don't know, um, we have people, Pacific and Oceanic people migrating um, from Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and many different, um, I guess, iterations. We have different voyagers coming and moving. And we have the last few um, oceanic islands, Hawaii, um, Rapa Nui, and um, New Zealand being occupied at some of the latest that are considered to be um, Polynesia. But the people who were occupying or um, the ancestors who were first occupying Hawaii were not Hawaiians just yet. They were Tahitians who utilized their knowledge of the tides and the stars uh, to navigate their ways to Hawaii. Um, so these indigenous people um, are known as Kanaka Maoli, which is Native Hawaiians. And those of us who are Hawaiian, uh, we believe that we've occupied our ancestral lands since time in memoriam. So in ancient Hawaii, we have this thing called the Kumulipo, which is the origin chant of Hawaii and Hawaiians. Uh, the Kumulipo uh, was supposed to be kind of an oral chant uh, because Hawaiian was not a language. It was a spoken language and it became written once it was attached to uh, an English alphabet by the Christian missionaries in the 1800s. So uh, the Kumulipo uh, would take days to recite because it was um, a genealogical connection between Native Hawaiians and the ancestral lands and cosmological deities. So it started from the beginning of time. It started from darkness and ended to whomever would have been the um, current reigning monarch or chief at that moment. So together in the beginning of the Kumulipo, like I said, we have darkness. And then we have Papa Hanaomoku, who is Papa or Earth Mother, and Wakea, who is Sky Father, uh, creating the Hawaiian Islands. And um, then later, the environment, the land, the sea, animals, anything else that kind of dwells in nature. and Native Hawaiians were the last people that were created. Um, you can see this through linguistics, actually. So uh, commoners are um, kama aina. Um, and aina, the word there meaning land. So it literally translates to people of the land. Uh, we are considered people of the land. And we are the last people that were created in the Kumulipo. So we see uh, kind of, I guess, a cultural pillar, uh, which is called Kuleana, um, which I guess could be loosely translated to responsibility. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it responsibility. It's more of a, a really strong uh, calling um, and I think cultural need um, to serve and take care of something. So, um, us being the last thing that's created, we find that we need to take care of our elders, which ends up being our ancestors, the land around us, um, and those who dwell, which end up being gods or goddesses. So Mauna Awakea, uh, Mauna meaning mountain, um, of Wakea is actually now known as Mauna Kea, uh, which means the white mountain and also Mauna Kea, which is the proper name for it. So Mauna Awakea is a space in which Papa and Wakea created the literal first life. Therefore, Mauna Kea is a cosmologically sacred mountain where all life originates and is named after one of the first gods in Hawaiian cosmology. And it's also the realm of Poliahu, who is a goddess of Mauna Kea, who protects the summit and all the sacred temples that sit atop the mountain. So still talking about the... Um, 
sacredness in ancient Hawaii uh, of Mauna Kea, we have this thing called the kapu system. And kapu uh, means sacred. It's actually where the English word taboo comes from. So the kapu system organized this aspect of society through rigid cultural norms and hierarchies. Uh, these social hierarchies through the kapu system distinguished ali'i, who are chiefs or leaders of royalty, as the direct descendants of gods in the kumulipo. So because of this, ali'i had mana, which is, um, I guess, spiritual power. It's kind of like physical power or spiritual power that is manifest through the person itself. Uh, to access these uh, sacred spaces that commoners actually were not able to access. So these spaces included uh, cosmologically important sites like Heiau, which are religious and ceremonial temples, um, and spaces where they believed deities to dwell. So of course, Mauna Kea, uh, which was established as Kapu through the Kumulipo, like I just said, um, was solely accessible to these ali'i and chiefs or royalty. Uh, the ability to access the summit was incredibly restricted. Only a few of the highest ranking ali'i um, or maybe kahuna who are priests that uh, perform ceremonial activities at these shrines were allowed to go. Um, this definitely wasn't a place that people would just come hang out it was a place in which you'd make the trek up the mountain once a year and, you know, you'd have to be like some of the highest ranking chief or priest and have access to a lot of this specific cultural and sacred knowledge that a lot of other people would not have access to. Um, so moving a little bit forward away from ancient Hawaii to the formation of the Kingdom of Hawaii. Um, this kingdom, uh, which was led by monarchs, um, kept this land aside specifically for Native Hawaiians in the late 1800s uh, when there was this rapid expansion of agricultural plantations. Um, we had something similar in the late 1800s called the Great Mahele. And if you can think of almost the equivalent of like North American um, Native peoples being um, restricted to um, reservations. This is almost an equivalent to this. Um, so these crown lands were, um, well I guess they were called crown lands, I didn't say that, but uh, these crown lands uh, belonged to the kingdom um, and unfortunately they were supposed, or I guess fortunately they were supposed to set aside land for Native Hawaiians um, to protect them and their sacred land. However, this adversely affected them in which the crown lands um, eventually became lands of the United States. Um, and then this land was not, um, it was not good land. Um, is land in area where the soil wasn't as good to grow kalo, which is um, taro. And it just wasn't good um, land for growing anything on or sustaining life. But during the illegal annexation of Queen Liliuokalani in 1899, white American businessmen uh, overthrew the kingdom of Hawaii and illegally ceded these lands. Uh, so basically, uh, we have these lands that were set aside for Native Hawaiians being taken away. Most of what was considered the kingdom of Hawaii now belongs to the United States when um, when they overthrew and eventually Hawaii became a state in 1959. Um, now all these lands belong to the United States. Um, so the crown lands, which of course included Mauna Kea, belongs to the United States. So now moving more towards astronomy, um, while Mauna Kea was considered to be such a sacred space to Native Hawaiians, in the 1960s, the University of Hawaii, which I'll be referring to as UH, along with the occupying state of Hawaii, noted that um, it was astronomically perfect, um, the summit of Mount Akea. It's right above the cloud clearing, which gives you a nice view of the stars. I don't study astronomy. Like I said, I'm an anthropologist, archaeologist, um, but, you know, it doesn't take a genius to note, obviously Native Hawaiians purposely made this space sacred um, due to the cloud clearing. 
Um, and Mount Akea, which is actually the tallest mountain in the world from below sea level, is situated at this height where you can build uh, many different telescopes for it to thrive. Um, and beginning in the 1960s, astronomical activities at Mount Akea have been managed by UH through a lease with the Bureau of Land and Natural Resources. And while these original permits allowed for only one observatory, and these permits were actually after the fact permits, they weren't um, permitted at the time of construction, 12 telescopes have been constructed over the past 50 years, um, which is kind of incredible that they want to build a 13th one. So as this public concern grew, the auditor of the state of Hawaii released four reports uh, spanning over about 20 years, the first being in 1998, addressing the environmental and cultural impacts of these astronomical activities. Um, and the auditor actually finds that um, there are many different reports, as I've said, that um, due to weak management plans after the fact permits and um, I guess not a lot of checkups, the University of Hawaii failed to protect natural resources and cultural spaces at Mauna Kea. So, um, for example, the environmental um, degradation um, shows that um, orange coolant was spilled right on the mountain. Um, as we all know, mountains are perfectly situated for um, the water table. It's the beginning of the water table usually. Um, so oftentimes if the water was um, polluted at the summit, um, it'll bring it downstream to Hilo and Kona. Um, we also have about um, tons of trash being picked up, costing the state $20,000 um, through helicopter. And um, obviously cultural degradation is happening because there's a potential um, for archeological spaces to deteriorate here. So uh, with the introduction of the 30 meter telescope, what is dubbed to be the world's largest telescope in 2010, uh, Kanaka communities, uh, Native Hawaiians, fear the perpetuation of mismanagement and degradation at their sacred site. And since 2015, Native Hawaiian activists have publicly opposed the construction of the 30 meter telescope, yet only the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has taken legal action against the state in the 30 meter um, telescope international observatory. Um, and basically since 2014, there's been a large legal battle uh, between Native Hawaiians who were initially arrested at groundbreaking ceremonies. Uh, the government has often flip-flopped their views uh, with the governor initially stating that he opposes the 30-meter telescope, a uh, little hiatus of the telescope construction, and returning to um, the construction in July of 2019 where the government publicly, including the governor, uh, supports the construction because of the money it could bring in to the state itself. Um, however, blatantly ignoring Native Hawaiian um, viewpoints. Um, so since July, we have Native Hawaiian activists, um, not just activists, actually, most people of the Native Hawaiian community and our allies um, occupying the access road of Mauna Kea, um, which means astronomers could not go and check up on the telescopes, uh, but which also meant, though, that uh, these construction materials could not access uh, the Mauna itself. Um, in July, we also had the arrest of 34 kupuna, who are our elders, and in most, um, I would say, indigenous cultures, we value our um, elders, and this is the same for Native Hawaiian culture. Um, so for our kupuna to be willingly arrested um, so, that, uh, so that the telescope could not be constructed, um, it shows a lot to us younger generations that this is something that we should deeply care about and deeply protect also. Um, at that time, um, Native Hawaiians also set up a base camp uh, and mini society with free university uh, that U the UH ironically allowed uh, credits <laughs> for. Um, free childcare, free meals, free medical services. And in December, the Kia'i moved up, uh, move their camp up the mountain to agree uh, to a pause in the construction for two months. Um, I originally wrote this back in February. Uh, it's now mid-March and um, 
that's when the cease construction was to end. Nothing really happened there. It was like a weird limbo. Um, but now due to the coronavirus threats and just the idea of like gathering and a lot of the people who stay up there for long periods of time are elders uh, to protect everybody, they called off the camp. I think they spent about eight months or almost 300 days up there, which is incredible. And, oh, it's mid-April. Sorry about that. <laughs> Don't know uh, what month it is. But basically, what I'm saying is they spent about eight months or 300 days up on the Mauna, which is incredible, an incredible occupation for Native Hawaiians and a win uh, because it doesn't look like the 30-meter telescope is going to be built anytime soon. And I think the second that there is this threat um, to build uh, while we are all quarantined, Native Hawaiian activists and their allies will be there six feet apart from everybody um, getting ready to blockade the camp yet again. So that's kind of my spiel about Mauna Kea. Um, if you have any questions or details, I have written, like I said, this was kind of like my research at UCSC. Um, know kind of a lot about it but um, why it matters to the UC system is really complex so uh, Will will have Will has more statistics about this than I do but basically um, the UC system I think the UC trustees had committed a hundred and seventy five million dollars uh, will correct me if I'm wrong um, to the construction of the 30 meter telescope back in 2014 and this number has probably grown um, and with um, with our organization. Will and I are the core organizers for um, the UCSC Mauna Kea Protectors in Santa Cruz, and we've also connected with Berkeley, um, Stanford, a lot of other UC campuses and other, I guess, um, Cal universities uh, to protect. We've been going to the UC trustee meetings, um, and they've definitely, I think, heard our, um, heard our voices because I think they've decided to kind of talk more about it um, and see where the future is. Uh, considering the con it's not being constructed, they are wasting a lot of money. Um, so yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I think that's it for us, unless Mariah, do you have? I mean, um, I think the discussion. Oh, one thing we did want to talk about a little bit was the violence of the rental market and how that was connected to um, the COLA movement or how we were able to connect these issues. Um, so I'll briefly talk about that real quick. But something that is especially prevalent in California, in particular, particularly along the Pacific Coast, is the violence of the rental market for contemporary indigenous communities who find that they cannot afford to live in their ancestral homelands. And so in Santa Cruz, for example, many of the Amamuts and tribal community live hours away in places that are cheaper um, because housing is so unaffordable in Santa Cruz. So Val Lopez, for example, the chairman of the Amamuts and actually lives in the suburbs of Sacramento because it's much cheaper and drives hours to and from Santa Cruz in order to attend, um, you know, different political things or to attend events regarding the Mutsun. Um, and I know that's also the case for Chumash communities down in Santa Barbara. Um, where they are unable to live on their ancestral homelands because of the violence of the rental market. And so I feel like a lot of a lot of us who are organizing we're, we're connecting these larger issues um, and just showing how the UC is complicit in this as well and complicit in the fact that indigenous people cannot live in their ancestral homelands because it's unaffordable. Um, and I know I don't know if will if you had any other like anything else you wanted to share about that because I know. So I got I got dropped from the Zoom chat, um, so I missed it. But um, other current examples of things. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think there yeah, there's a lot of um, 
ongoing instances of indigenous um, resistance or indigenous resurgence um, that are happening all around us, um, <clears throat> including in areas where there are UC campuses. Um, a few examples of that include like the West Berkeley Shell Mound campaign in Berkeley, um, which is a campaign to prevent a, a development project on the Sacred Shell Mound site, um, which the UC is connected to uh, and in, in certain ways. And, you know, like in here in Santa Cruz on Amamutsan land, there's a ongoing struggle to protect a sacred site called Eurostack from development. So, um, so I think, yeah, one of the takeaways is just that there is, we live in a settler colonial society. The University of California has been an active player in that um, in some pretty significant ways. And uh, at the same time, people are fighting back and resisting all the time and, and trying to enact like resurgence of, of their indigenous societies. And so, um, so it's important to acknowledge that and like figure out where we can support those things in our capacities as students or just people who live live in these areas um yeah so um cool i think we so you know we've given this sort of history of the UC with some episodes like um, we've talked about the very Mariah talked about the origins of the UC. Carly talked about Mauna Kea as a, like a particularly um, significant uh, way that the UC is enacting settler colonialism right now. It's like the leader or arguably the main driving force of this project, the 30 meter telescope, which has met with this incredible um, movement in Hawaii. So you know, we've gone through these different things um, and hopefully that made sense to everyone. And like, I guess we want to have some time for discussion now or, or questions. Feel free to un unmute yourself and ask a question or type up your questions in the chat. Hi all, um, I wanted to make a comment. Um, again, my name is Sophia, I use she, her pronouns. Um, thanks again for um, hosting this. It was really insightful um, and I feel like I learned a lot. Um, a connection I made was um, with the university um, and construction is actually uh, our tuition. Um, I read this letter from faculty that was um, published in, in 2009, I think, in response to the proposed tuition raise. Um, and it talked about how our tuition, um, it's raised, okay, um, wait, sorry, I'm trying to formulate my thought. Um, so our tuition is actually taken out against construction bonds um, and this is what I learned from the the article is that our tuition is taken out um, against construction bonds so basically when um, when they raise our tuition they can borrow more money for private construction projects um, and I just I thought that that was really connected to this because not only is the university continuing to build on stolen land, it's continuing to build with stolen money. Um, and as tuition is increased and we're taking out more loans, the loan is actually um, the same money that like mortgage and student, like it's all of the same industry of like home loans um, and the student loan industry. I'm not formulating my thoughts very well. I can, um, I can link the article uh, but yeah. 
I have a comment as well. Um, it's more just for like the facilitators. Um, well, like I, I studied, you know, I studied bio when I was in school and um, I feel like I didn't get, I really didn't get a good history lesson, I think, in my education. And even just hearing this, like in this, you know, hour and a half or two hours that it's been is like insane to me, like so insane. I had never heard a bunch of things that were said today. Like I had no idea. And maybe that's just a lack of me, like not doing my own research, but it's just crazy to me that this is like the reality that we live in. And I just want to say thank you to y'all for hosting this. I'm so glad I was able to get in on this Zoom meeting because I like, really appreciate um being in the know about these things that are obviously like so goddamn important um so yeah I just want to say thanks for facilitating like y'all did an awesome job and like it's sad news to hear but it's good to know it you know so Yeah, can I ask kind of a related question to that? Um, and I'll preface by saying that, like, I'm a history PhD student, and I don't know any of this history. So I definitely think that it's being um, not presented on purpose. <laughs> um, but my question is kind of about, like, this nuclear testing and, and all this stuff that the UC is related to. I'm wondering if anybody could speak to like what the UC gets out of being so involved in that because it I mean I could see how at certain points in time it might be like you know a political prestige thing to be able to claim that but certainly um, now I don't think that would be very popular if it was very widespread knowledge so I'm just wondering like are they getting like government contracts that's making it profitable or like, like what is the the impulse to like continue this relationship to the development? Yeah. Um, let's quickly touch on that. The, uh, the contracts to run these labs are worth like $4 billion. Um, and that's, revenue that's not profit but um you know they're huge contracts and they provide huge resources that the university then manages and there's a lot of uh there's a lot of power and, and money um at stake in, in these contracts like there um lots of institutions have wanted to to run these labs um just so happens the uc uh, partly by like an accident of history and partly just because of like um, how the UC is as an institution got in at the beginning, like during the initial design of nuclear bombs during World War II, was in the leadership then, took over the management of these labs and just has managed them ever since then, um, or been a part of managing them. So. Yeah, I mean, the UC gets a huge amount of, of revenue out of it. They get, um, you know, a lot of um, scientific resources um, can be steered from the university into these labs. Uh, and so, and, and these days they try to distance themselves from nuclear weapons in their identity. So I think like part of your question is like how how is this bringing prestige to the university? Well, like the, these days, you know, they, the labs are presented as like these multi-purpose science labs that do all these other great things too. Like, you know, if you go on their website, they'll talk about how they developed like solar powered toaster ovens and things like that. Like, you know, just different things that aren't about nuclear weapons. Uh, but, you know, the vast majority of the budget of these labs is for nuclear weapons still. Um, but that's not what they emphasize anymore necessarily. Thank you. It's uh, good to know that they definitely have the money for COLA. They just don't want to give it to us. Yeah, um, I have a comment and a question if I could. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, my name is Marcelo I'm Garza Montalvo. I'm in Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm glad I could join. Uh, thank you all for um, for doing this, for hosting this space, this conversation. I was like, uh, you know, uh, really excited that somebody is is holding the space. And then I'm sorry I was late because I had a trouble finding the getting the link. Um, so I'm sorry if uh, any of my questions or comments are repetitive or have already been covered. Um, but um, some, I mean, something that always happens at, uh, for UC Berkeley in particular, which is on Huchin, uh, Chichenyo, Dishan, Ohlone land, um, is um, as soon as I got here, I was uh, educated about um, the 30,000 remains that are here. I'm not sure if that was covered uh, already, but one of the, the largest collection of actual uh, remains of ancestors' bodies uh, is in collections here at UC Berkeley. Um, and it's a kind of bureaucratic back and forth with NAGPRA um, and federal recognition, which uh, a lot of the lands we're occupying um, here are uh, not federally recognized folks, um, which is a big thing within the bureaucracy of, of native rights within the United States. Uh, it's only one level, but there's, it's, it helps uh, for folks to get things like rematriation and repatriation of, of um, ancestral remains. So that's, and then, uh, many parts of the collections of our anthropology and archaeology have been called to be uh, rematriated as long as I've been here. Um, so just to put that out there as we walk around UC Berkeley or our campuses, there, um, there are actual um, uh, remains you know, of folks that we need to honor um, uh, every, every time we, we step on this land. Um, and many burial grounds continue to be found um, as they construct, right? And so. Um, just to put that, um, just to offer that as something I've learned here. Um, and another thing, I'm sorry if this has also been covered, but um, I'm, my work is within like indigenous science. Uh, I'm ancestrally Mapuche uh, from the south of Chile and I do work with my community, but I'm also a, a Mexica Aztec dancer and I do my, my writing my dissertation about the science and, and, and knowledge that's embedded in our ceremonial dance and music and something I just I would I think is important for this conversation is that it's it's about like these material uh, conditions of land and colonialism of course but it's also about not respecting uh, native ways of knowing or other ways of knowing that are not part of this Eurocentric like it's not just um, the facts it's our it's the it's what I'm hearing from the Moana uh, what you're sharing from Moana Kea especially just like it's just like a profound clash of worldviews of like cosmovisiones of like what is reality what is the nature of life like what does it mean to be a human being that those questions are answered from a european perspective and that gives us like uh um it's just really problematic it's a really hard terrain in which to have these conversations um so i just want to put that as, as a comment and then my last my question is actually a question just to like crowdsource if anybody in this particular session knows um but one thing I've uh, learned or come across in um, in my in my activism here uh, that's maybe relevant to the demilitarizing um, demand that has come out of the cola situation is uh, the connections between the UC and uh, the settler colonial project of Israel um, and the IDF and I'm just wondering if anybody uh, one particular kind of like tidbit I heard, which I still have not been able to substantiate, which I want to because it's, I'm included, I want to include it in an article that's in press, um, but is about, um, at one point, um, it was shared with me that UCPD gets uh, two weeks of, if they choose to, um, anti-terrorist training in Israel-Palestine. Um, so things like that, that are very material ways that we're sending UCPD. I, I, again, I have not been able to like, uh, 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 find like a good source for that. So if anybody has any um, resources around the connection between the university as, as, as a Zionist institution or, or supporting Zionism, like um, which for all intents and purposes is a, is a part of the global settler, settler colonial project. Um, and then within that, at least something that's, that is within there is uh, the main spokesperson for UC Berkeley's public affairs um, Dan Mogolov is um, like former um, IDF and uh, former kibbutz team uh, and, and is like really active in like Zionist uh, networks. But 
Um, and it's just, it's significant because in an article that I'm writing, I found quotes from him also like really like showing so much love to the moral act and like was really like excited about the university as this like beacon of progress and just really used exactly the same um, discourse that, you know, is uh, about uh, occupying these lands. So um, sorry if that was long winded, but I'm, I'm, I'm really excited by this, by this space. So thanks for, for letting me, for including me. Hello, thank you for mentioning um, the ancestor remains at Berkeley. That's definitely something I know about being a native anthropology, archaeology person in the UC system. So thank you for sharing that. And yeah, um, my research, I guess, just to um, like briefly touch on it, it was talking about how um, we don't understand, like there's a clash of epistemologies when creating protect, like the U.S. Uh, creates protective spaces like the National Heritage Protection Act, which is supposed to protect Mauna Kea um, and the idea of protection um, in Native Hawaiian. And I'm Native Hawaiian, so I see a clash of these things. Um, it's just funny, fun, I, like my research was about how kind of like funny and unfortunate it is that, you know, these protections don't align and that um, we have instances in which indigenous people feel more of a um, direct, call to protect and what it means to protect um, in an indigenous cosmologically epistemologically epistemological way rather than a land protection from like a u.s like resource capitalistic democratic way of progressing just really briefly we also have um a question that was put in the chat um so if it's okay if i read them and address them so um the question is from Quentin and it says, is there somewhere else the telescope can be constructed? Is Mauna Kea the best site? Um, so really quickly, yeah, they, um, I think the TMT is looking at building um, it possibly in the Canary Islands, uh, which is owned by Spain. Um, not, I think it's like about like the same kind of idea with cloud covering. Um, the thing is, I think a lot of us don't want to push for that because um, People are saying, and maybe Will might correct me on this, um, but they're not sure if this is also an indigenous homeland to someone else. A lot of people are saying, oh, like there isn't, no, this, nobody is claiming to that land, but I think um, that there is, and it's kind of being covered up at this moment. Um, I know that they're actually already, um, the TMT is actually considering permits in the Canary Islands at this moment. Um, I think, that is Mauna Kea the best site um, in the U.S.? Yes, I think it is, um, just because of where it is situated um, and its elevation, but um, I don't think there's anywhere else in the U.S. they could possibly build it. Um, it's also pretty close to, um, like they have a lot of, they being like a lot of different institutions, um, states, and um, I guess different countries, they have these connections to these uh, telescopes that are already on Mount Achaea. So I think it's easier to just root themselves next to say, you know, another telescope. I know the UC already has a telescope there. Is it Keck? Yes. So there's already a UC affiliated telescope there um, and different countries have affiliations with these telescopes also. Um, something important, I guess, to up for an update on Mount Achaea is that different governments have pulled out of funding. Um, India has pulled out their funding and so has, I guess, Japan for next year when they're envisioning their budget. So a lot of these countries, I think, have lost faith um, in the construction. Um, in the pursuit of science, how much should we acknowledge religious ob objections to particular scientific pursuits? I guess how we use objectivity and logic to continue practices of erasure and marginalization and how participants in the university system do we challenge and resist, resist such practices and framings and yeah, Carl, yeah. If you don't sorry mind, go ahead but no no thanks um i really appreciate it um and yeah those questions that i was asking uh uh it can we move somewhere else well that somebody else has some indigenous native land somewhere right so it's just it's, we're not actually addressing it and so i think actually uh marcello answered it inherently in what he was talking about with just other ways of knowing and then how you were responding with uh, uh, clashes of, of epistemologies, right? And so, um, yeah, I, uh, to me, that's kind of like the, 
I took a very long winded way of trying to get to this point of like, you know, uh, in finding solutions or in using, you know, logic or reasoning, how are we, you know, continuing to just perpetuate uh, the problem that we're really here discussing, which is this marginalization, this erasure, this displacement. And yeah, I'm just throwing that out there. I just thought that might be, you know, how we think about about that and then like as we're all participants in the university system right like what where do we go beyond this discussion here today Thank yeah you. no definitely those are all <laughs> really big questions and i think definitely something since i've been kind of like a mount care protector at ucsc i've had to think about the ways in which you know i align myself like i was um on the first day of the COLA strike, since Will and I are, and also Mariah's, um, we're all like UCSC, um, you know, uh, PhD students, or we were at the time, I'm not. Um, but I think definitely something that we've been thinking about, and I think maybe more Mariah than us, since Mariah is um, COLA for all. But like how we can think of like the intersection of like decolonizing and pushing these agendas while also pushing other agendas um, like COLA and Mauna Kea and um, did you say that you were UCSC affiliated? Uh, yes, so, yeah, I, I graduated in uh, last June and then I'm a part, I got hired as a part-time lecturer currently. Gotcha, so um, the People's Coalition, um, which is kind of a undergraduate group of, I don't really know how to describe them, but they're all around incredible people. Um, they created like a list of demands for the administration. And I think in that list of TMT, um, the, I guess, divesting um, from TMT was up there, which was incredibly meaningful to us, uh, considering that wasn't an ask, a direct ask of us, but more of something that they found as important to demand from the chancellor. So um, I think definitely people in the institution are starting to think about this and see it as how else can we, you know, we don't just stop at Mount Achaia. We don't just stop at Colo. You know, we think of ways and how we can apply to ev everything. And yeah, I guess this is where this teaching was kind of going too. <laughs> Anyone else for questions or comments or responses? Uh, I did put it in the chat that if anybody want, who wanted to see the PowerPoint that I was going to show um, could email me at kderegoucse.edu um, um, or privately message me in this chat. I also have a, a YouTube lecture that I gave um, to a class last quarter um if anybody is interested in sharing it doing whatever they want with it um i definitely would love to share but thanks Thanks, Will, for putting that in the chat. Okay, so I also should really quickly plug um, the organization that we're a part of, which is the UCSC Mount Care Protectors, which I said um, we're part of kind of a broader Mount Care Protectors where we received a call from the Kia'i, uh, the protectors at Mount Kea, to create this group because of the interesting perspective and influence that we can have on UC administration. Um, at UCSC, we do have a particular board member of the 30 meter telescope. So that's why it was more important for us, I think, to try to influence this. So uh, Will did put our Instagram there in the chat. It's UCSC Mauna Kea Protectors. And we also have a Facebook uh, page, um, which is Mauna Kea Protectors at UCSC. Some kind of thank you, Will. He just put in the link. Um, yeah, I also can put my own contact information if anybody wants to get in touch with anything. Um, we're trying to send a letter uh, to meet with the chancellor um, right now, so that'll be really fun. I think that's it for me. Um, yeah, just say, I feel like so we're almost out of time. I think we're going to get kicked off Zoom in a couple minutes, and it's um, it feels like a lot of conversations are kind of getting started. Um, 
I know Mariah just put um, her info. Oh, Carly just put her info. So yeah, um, feel free to email us. And like, um, I'm hoping we'll also have a, a follow-up class of some kind um, in Strike University. I'm not sure what that's going to look like. Um, Mariah, do you want to talk about the disorientation guide idea at all, or, or no? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I guess, yeah, we, that was kind of like, we were just thinking about how we could restart the disorientation guide that used to um, be published by UCSC students. And I know, Will, you said you've been a part of that process in the past. Um, um, but we definitely want to include a lot of the stuff that we talked about today um, in those type of publications. So if anyone is interested in sharing any writing they would like, um, regarding these topics or anything like that, you could get in, in contact with Will, myself, Carly. Um, and yeah, that would be something cool we can do. <laughs> thank you all so much, Carly, Mariah, and Will for hosting this. This was wonderful and thank you all for attending. Um, I apologize for having to pause here we have another teaching that starts at four that you're all welcome to stay for uh, michael becker is going to be talking about aesthetics semiotics and collective action and yeah carly will and mariah it would be wonderful to have a follow-up to this teaching if if you are willing to continue these conversations thank you so much thank you yes thank you Thanks. Thank Everyone you stay healthy. Uh, Thanks. Michael, are you here?